Alright, welcome back to my tutorial series. Uh, in this episode, I want to talk a little bit about how to record, interpret, display, and present uh, simulation results. Uh, and this could reply to any type of simulation. This isn't necessarily just um, Autodesk Frame Simulator, or rather the Frame Simulator within Autodesk Inventor. This could apply to anything. Um, but the two examples I'm going to use in this case are from that realm. Uh, potentially, I might make a different one that talks about other projects I've done, but I don't have access to that software right now because of you know the whole global situation. Uh, anyhow, uh, this is the uh, kind of the rough, pretty quick simulation that I did for my senior design project, which was uh, the five-person tandem bike. Um, uh, what we wanted to do is basically make a five-person tandem bike but we wanted to be able to take segments out so it could be anywhere between one and five. Uh, and what that meant was optimizing the frame strength for having five people and then also pulling load numbers uh, for uh, what, what it would look like where the connectors were. And so that was uh, how we used the, um, the frame generator. You can see a side view of the frame here. Uh, in the analysis software, we've got one contour plot of displacement and one contour plot of strength. Um, I would say this is the bare minimum. I would also, if you're going to do more from here, obviously more angles. Uh, in this case, it we I can kind of get away with two because you can see everything in the frame with no, with no uh, nothing blocking each other, all in one view. Uh, that is one thing that makes doing two-dimensional frames a lot easier than 3D frames. Um, but additionally. I also have a probe down here uh, at this node where the um, where the where the load would be pretty high but also where the connector would be so in this I don't I obviously don't have the ability to model a specific connector like with threads and whatnot within uh, Autodesk uh, frame simulator so what I did is I pulled a a, a uh, a moment and a force on that on that bottom link there which is right there uh, and put it into this graph or this table rather so for every single segment or every single um, every single configuration is what I called them this being configuration one um, I have for every single configuration, I have a set of screenshots on a correlating slide. So this is the set of screenshots for configuration one. I have what size uh, all the different tubes are. So in this case, we had a fixed geometry. Uh, the geometry was fixed by our some of our other design constraints. So it actually made it a little easier. So I only varied the tube wall thickness. Um, geometry is something that is a much wider design space. But if you can narrow down your geometry kind of using some using a couple initial simulation results, uh, it can be a lot easier to narrow that first and then pick your tube sizes based off that geometry. So what we did here is we had fixed geometry and I have each of these is, um, each of these is what the tube wall thickness is. So you can see they're labeled um, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then in every segment, three, four, five, six is the same. Uh, and bold just means it would change from the previous one. Um, and um, so you can see here are all of the parameters that I recorded for everyone. So I recorded weight, uh, I recorded deformation of the middle bike seat. So you can see I have a probe there at the middle bike seat as well. Um, the max stress in KSI, uh, the max force on the bottom link, uh, the max moment on the bottom link. Uh, the max a moment in, uh, on the bottom link in foot pounds, uh, the strength of the yield strength of the steel that we were using in this case 1020, which is pretty generic cold rolled steel, um, and that was so that we could calculate a factor of safety. Uh, so in this case, we wanted to be able to visualize um, our primary concerns were displacement versus chassis weight. We wanted it to be pretty light, and we wanted it to be pretty rigid. We weren't too concerned about factor of safety because they're all really high. And in retrospect, that means that my tube thicknesses needed to go down a lot or the, or the size of the tubes or something. Basically, what that's telling me is that the, tube, the tubes that I've picked are pretty oversized. And this was a really over beefy design. But 
within that design space, you can see that we've got options here anywhere between about you know 65 pounds and 53 pounds and the displacement of the center seat from 40 thousandths all the way down to 30 thousandths. Uh, so you don't, I don't have a ton of, of a very wide range of, uh, of configurations here because I was in a pretty big rush to do this. But um, something you could consider doing would be adding more configurations based off the first round of results or you know present once you've presented these results, Maybe some of that feedback might be, oh, you know, these are all really heavy options. Could you come up with anything lighter? We're willing to give a little on the displacement. So then you go back and add another row of configurations. Um, but uh, for actually presenting this data, uh, I'd, I'd recommend putting it in a PowerPoint like this. So, you know, you kind of say at your title slide, you have a picture of what you're doing to give a, a general idea of kind of what the design space is. Um, and I'll... I'll show a little bit more formal presentation in a moment, but um, for this one, this was kind of just to record screenshots and just kind of have a place to put them. But um, this is this is definitely a format that I'd recommend. PowerPoints are nice because it allows you to be really organized with where everything is. Um, okay, let's look at take a look at something that was a little bit more complex to put together. I want to pull up uh, this. But in the meantime, let's take a look at this. Okay, so you, what we can see here is this is a little bit more complex thing. So what this is is the rear frame sim study. Uh, so basically everything from the roll hoop back was done in its own group. Uh, that's another trick that I've used in the past is to separate them into groups. So I started with, it, with the middle section here and then moved on to the front and then to the rear. Uh, and they, they all take a little little bit of time, but it's a lot less time than if you try to do it all together, you know? So if you have five or six different choices to choose from from each section, and then you gotta do those all intermingled with each other, uh, it can make a lot, it can kind of save you a lot of time to choose them individually. It might not be the best, um, but it saves you a lot of time that way. Okay, so for the rear here, we've got, um, basically all these tubes here are uh, some of them are required by the rules, and then um, and then all the other ones are ones that we add. Some of these are to imitate other structures. So, for example, this box is a big aluminum box, and these four right here are the engine. Um, so those are not actually part of the design study, but these other ones are. So basically, you can see again, I have um, I have the uh, the main hoop, main hoop brace, and main hoop brace support are all fixed. Um, they're, they're all set by the rules, so you can see they don't change here. Um, but then all of the other stuff here is kind of, it's fair game. So basically what I was trying to set out to do here is figure out which, which tubes making them thicker would have a bigger impact on the torsional rigidity, which is what I'm measuring at the end of the day. Um, so again, this one I've done pretty similar. I kind of flipped it a little bit. I have the parameters that I'm recording up here and then I have the, um, and then I have the, and then I have all the tube thicknesses down here. Again, bold just indicates that they changed from the previous one. So what I I typically start out by doing a rule required tubes only. I do a minimum, make everything the minimum it can be, uh, make everything the maximum it can be, and then honestly, by the time I get there, and usually look at these three results. Uh, by then, you can look at this, all, all of these, right? Um, you can look at the displacement and the stress of every single one. And you can kind of start to get a sense, kind of using the displacement and the chassis weight, you know, okay, I've got a range of four pounds, and I'm uh, changing the node by anywhere from a quarter inch uh, to, uh, you know, 188 thousandths. So you can kind of get, get an idea of where your design range is, and then you can try to optimize. And so essentially what we did from there, or what I did from there rather, was uh, think about, you know, well, what, what changes made the biggest difference, all while recording everyone, both in screenshots and, um, and in actual numbered parameters. And the reason I say you need both um, is because when you're actually presenting these results, you really want to be able to see where that stress is uh, and it's nice to have a visual aid when you're talking about it, and it allows you to kind of more fundamentally understand it. If you're only recording numbers, uh, it's it's just going to kind of be you're you're picking the best one. 
you know, objectively, but you also do want to use some subjectivity here. Like, you know, if, if a couple tubes are, are really stressed, but it shows that it's very efficient, you know, it might make sense to take the, that single tube down a, uh, a size or two. Um, okay, so back to this tool. I kind of mentioned this briefly in the last one, uh, but this is a tool that I've been using for a while now, and it was something that I came up with when I was doing a project. I don't know if this is really the correct way to do this, but every time I've presented it, uh, it seems to get pretty good feedback, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, and essentially all I have is a graph of displacement versus weight again. And all I did was I graphed a point. I can go to select data here. I graphed a point using, and I clicked the x value to, I used a scatter plot. I made the x value as the weight. So Alt-1, reported weight. And then, um, and then displacement of the front node. Uh, again, I clicked that, and then I made the label uh, Alt-1. And then I, I just turned on data labels for the graph. And what it allows you to do is kind of visualize. You can see that there's a trend here, right? Like, and that trend, if you, that's a good sign. That, that trend should exist. That means that um, as, you go, as you go up in chassis weight, uh, it gets more rigid, which makes sense. Uh, but what you want is you actually want a design that's far off the trend. So, for example, this is the one that I, I think I ended up recommending because it's one of the lightest, but it's kind of on the better side of that trend as well. Um, uh, so, and this is a great tool. Uh, you know, if, if you're presenting to a room of people and you're showing them this table and these graphs, that's really hard to read. But if, if you've decided that your key priorities are displacement and weight, it makes it pretty easy for people to visualize. Now, that's not to say that you also couldn't make, um, you know, you, you could do a three-dimensional plot with a third parameter. You could change displacement out for a factor of safety. Uh, you know, there's any number of things you can do with these presentations. But um, I'm just going to look at an example of a presentation here real quick. I think this is a different one. Forgive the cheesy design. But um, basically, I was just describing, you know, the pretty much the same things I talked about in the last video. This was the first time I had changed from uh, using a solid body simulation, so I was kind of explaining the difference. Again, um, I, I talked about what these different things were, but again, looking at this for the first time, it's pretty much impossible to understand it. So you have to try to... Um, I, one thing I did in, in a later one, like in this one, was I talked about, okay, this one is the minimum... This one is, you know, mostly the maximum tube sizes. This one's, uh, you know, and it can start getting hard to come up with two or three word descriptions. But uh, to people seeing that for the first time, it's really helpful. Um, and then I talked about the results here. And again, recommend uh, showing this graph because it's really helpful to people to be able to visualize it. Uh, and then I'd put all your screenshots so, you know, hey, OK, I, I'm, people might say, OK, I'm interested in that one. Let's see what the stress contour looks like. You say, okay, you know, here's where we're looking at our stress concentrations. Here's why I made some of the decisions I did. And it, it also really helps uh, if you kind of present these as objectively as you can. And then show the graph and say, hey, you know, here's the one I'm thinking about recommending to you guys. But I wanted to show you and make sure first, walk them through your thought process. Uh, and it's a lot easier to get buy-in for your design if people are giving input on on the decision and you know it's often oftentimes people will come to the same conclusions that you did but it also is helpful for you because they can especially when you make it in a so easy to look at like this if you did it properly they can help you make recommendations like oh you know if everything's really on a, on a if everything all your results are really linear then you know maybe you got to try some some more different designs and get something that's off the curve or if your designs don't make that downward slope trend, well, maybe you did something wrong. You need to review your simulation methods to make sure that you are uh, getting something a little more accurate. Um, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no expert here, um, so I just wanted to give you a kind of brief look inside how I, um, how I record my data. So kind of in summary, make sure you're recording both screenshots and data. Uh, because together they will help you make a stronger case for your design. Um, present them in a way that involves the people that you're presenting to. 
Um, it's, it helps you get buy-in for your design. Um, trying to think of anything else, uh, but that's all that's coming to mind for the moment. I, will, uh, I may add on to this video if something else comes to me. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, the one thing I might add is, I was kind of alluding to it earlier, but think of it as an iterative process, right? You don't necessarily have to do all of them once. You don't have to pick all of your sizes and then, or pick all of your tube sizes and then look at the results. I might do a max and then a minimum and then kind of look at the stress contours and say, okay, these ones are really stressed and then do a couple more and kind of look at how those stacked up against the previous ones. You know, you can kind of do, that's kind of the benefit of working with computers that you can do multiple iterations of the design all when sitting down at once. Um, the other thing is is trying trying to think about whether the changes you make actually made the difference you thought it was going to make. So, for example, say I see this tube here is really green. It's one of the more stressed tubes, and then I change it. D well, did it actually affect torsional rigidity, or did it just make that tube less stressed? You know, because if it doesn't actually help you achieve the goal, then you know it's okay for a tube to be stressed, uh, especially if it doesn't have a very significant contribution to the actual strength of the chassis in this example. Um, so kind of test your own mental model to see if it actually aligns with what's going on. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have for now. Um, I will see you next time.